This is another episode of Red Inca, and today we're going to be talking about the worst things to happen to West Indies cricket over the last few months. It's a bit of a vague date range because I didn't want to go back and search when every bad thing had happened to West Indies cricket. But, you know, don't worry, it's not just me. We've got Michelle Sir Patrick Hewitt, the man from West Indies on 99.94 across with us. Uh, to go through this. So I basically contacted you and I said, we should do a podcast on um, all the, on a power list ranking out of all the worst things that happened in West Indies recently. And uh, you were just like, I'm there. When do you need me? Um, because I mean, think about it. It's like, you know, when you see a car crash, right? And you think, oh my God, that's bad. And then another car doesn't see the car crash. And so it crashes into the car crash and you go, oh, that's horrific. And then you see the viral video where that happens about eight times in a row. That's West Indian cricket right now. Yeah, most definitely, Jared. Um, it, it, it's hard to really put into words how much of a shambles um, West Indies cricket has been in the last year. And And what's weird about saying that phrase is that implies that it's purely down to like administration and some the, like they're not being led properly or something like that. But some of the stuff that's happened is actually nothing to do with the administration of West Indies cricket. It's just that anything that could possibly go wrong from an optics point of view has gone wrong in the last six to eight months. Um, so we've both, we've both come up with five issues each. And what I would do, and it was hard for me to limit it to five. I'm not even sure I've got the best five now because the more I thought about it, the more there was. Um, but I think between the two lists, hopefully we'll have it all covered. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to go first and then I'm going to see where that particular issue is on my list and we'll go through it that way. So, Mash, coming in at number one on the absolute worst thing to happen to the West Indies in the last few months is what? This, I had to um and ah about this to decide what's actually number one, but I've gone for Shimron Hetmeyer missing two flights to the World Cup. In the, <laughs> that's that's got to be number one. And the reason I'm so I've... glad you said that because it's my <laughs> number one as well. And I was thinking that I was going to go out on a limb, and you're going to be like Jared. Come on now, but I want to hear why it's number one for you, and then I'm going to explain why it's number one for me. So when I, <clears throat> sorry, when I was putting the list together, I was trying to think, well, what deserves to be number one? And the reason I've gone for Shimron is because there's so many different aspects that come into play with Shimron. So first and foremost, there's the optics of he's technically seen by many as the brightest prospect in West Indies cricket. Some will say Nicholas Puran, but... To most in global cricket, they'd say Shimron Hetmeyer, brightest prospect in West Indies cricket. This is a guy that slowly but surely has drifted away from West Indies cricket, whether it be fitness tests, whether it be this, that or the other. Now, West Indies has ha had had a kind of disastrous T20 year anyway, leading up into the World Cup. But when you look at the incident in the cold light of day, you have a star batter who you just reintegrated into the side, which also needs to come into the factors here. You just reintegrated into the side against India. And the story to this day doesn't make any more sense than it did at the time. <laughs> he, he, he indicates that he can't catch the flight and asks his Cricket West Indies to reschedule the flight so he can make that flight to go to Australia. And then on the day of the flight indicates that he cannot get that flight either. And I, here's, here's, here's how I put it in context, Jared. I cannot think of any other cricket nation, full member or otherwise, where one of their star players, globally recognized star players, would pull a stunt like this. And because I can't, identify any other nation where this would happen that's why it's got to be number one um because despite no other nation having a stunt like this happen it's it feels like it fits for the west indies though it feels like this is on brand <laughs> with everything that could happen to us though so um i think for the for the global optics and for what it says about 
are young players and their their care or lack thereof for playing for West Indies, it kind of fits with West Indies cricket in general in 2022. I would agree with everything you've said. I think there's one thing you've missed, which is when this happened before, it generally happened because the previous board were at war with the players, mm. right? And and even some of the players, you know, like Andre Russell and Sun on Orion, there are other issues, right? There's no real issue with Shimron Hetmeyer. They had brought him back. This board is light years better. It's funny seeing Dave Cameron's head pop back up um, in Jamaica and, and start to gloat about how bad the West Indies. Every good thing that happened in West Indies cricket happened in spite of him when he was in charge. Yeah. He was way worse than the current management. It's not even... I'm not friends with the current management. I don't think I've ever met Ricky Skerritt. I, it's just obvious from the outside that that is the case. So that's why I had Shimron at number one, though, is because that that nonsense, the missing the flights and the bringing him back in and then him not wanting to be involved at the last minute, that feels like from the bad old days, they'd already got past, yeah. right? And it's like, so it's a combination of the days when you couldn't actually get a West Indian to, if they were any good, to play for your team, on top of the fact that he then did it in the way that I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here, but whether he meant it or not, the most embarrassing way possible <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> because it made it sound like he either didn't know how to get on a plane or didn't want to get on a plane, or he was never planning on doing it in the first place or whatever. Right. Like it, like it was an absolute clusterfuck situation of, there was no way that they couldn't be. And it's the maximum embarrassment. Everything else that you and I have on this list might be more important but as you were saying before, this is the global star. It, it, Fabian Allen, didn't Fabian Allen miss a tournament because he didn't get on a plane once? Like, these things happen, right? Uh, what's his, um, Bryce McGain in Australia all those years ago missing. Players miss planes and players pull out of tournaments at the last minute. Having Shimon Hetmeyer do it twice, <laughs> essentially in a row, um, it's just, it was unable for the rest of the world cricket to ignore it. And I think that's why I had it number one. But I think we're right. We've nailed this so far. One out of one. All right. What have you got at number two on your list? Okay. So this is where it gets a bit technical now. So because you made a very good point just then, some of the other things on the list are probably more important in terms of the impact on West Indies cricket. But yeah, Hetmeyer is the most embarrassing. So he's number one. Number two, I've got, Pollard stepping down as T20 and ODI captain. And the, the, the this reason is I... good because this goes well off my script. The, I, I yeah. didn't even have it on. There's A, there's been about a million people step down. So I'm not actually sure who's working in West Indies cricket at the moment, but I didn't have this on. So take me through it. So the reason I've got Pollard stepping down is Pollard's. Pollard's biggest reason for stepping down from the captaincy was that effectively it had enough of being cussed out from everybody. So the fans, the media, um, ex-cricketers, ex-administrators, etc. Pollard, and for those who don't understand, those listening who and watching who don't understand West Indies cricket, the cuss out is a West Indian's favourite pastime. And uh, <laughs> and Pollard. Oh, I've, Pollard. you know how I feel. The worst, uh, they are the most aggressive cricket fans in the world. It's just that there are so few of them. People don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> so Pollard, having faced a cuss out since taking the job all the way through to from 2019 to 2022, the the, the ultimate reason why I've got it as the the second biggest problem is he did this in a World Cup year, and that's not for me to blame Pollard per se. That's not the point I'm trying to make. Again, actually quite similar to the Hetmeyer reasoning, it completely destabilised where West Indies were going. So you have the elder statesman, one of the few experienced players in the West Indies white ball setup, who's been there, done this, done that, played everywhere. You're six months out from a World Cup and he says, that's it now. I've had enough. I, 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 can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't. It's time for me to step away. And... What happens six months later? 
we crash out of the World Cup with an inexperienced captain with a team that looks like an absolute shambles and mess. <laughs> so, so I think looking at where West Indies white ball setup is now going into 2023, you can go back six months and say, you know what, Pollard? For the good of West Indies cricket, you should have forced yourself to stay on for a bit longer because... Now we're all, now we're looking at the situation, saying who's going to be the next captain, and we can't identify anybody with with Puran having stepped down. So I would look back at Pollard's captaincy and say, actually, that was far more significant than people give it credit for, and possibly I think some people in West Indies cricket might be eating a bit of humble pie at the vociferous nature at which they cussed him out, and might be saying actually it would have been for the best if he'd stayed on for a bit longer. So I didn't have him on the list. And the reason I didn't have him on the list is partly because he's now retired from Mumbai Indians. Uh, and when I asked around why he was, why he stepped down from the captaincy, it wasn't, and these are people that I wouldn't say are particularly in his camp, right? Mm. So, you know, they weren't Trinidad boys or anything I reached out to or, you know, his agent, but these were people in West Indies cricket. And I said, why did he step down? And they said, look, we knew he only had so much to go in his knees. And we knew that chances are we weren't going to get that much more out of him. And, you know, they weren't saying that the rest of the stuff that you've talked about didn't play a part. Because clearly, I mean, <laughs> Jason Holder, brilliant politician. Darren Sammy, the best politician in cricket. Kyron Pollard, literally the worst politician I've ever seen. <laughs> Just <laughs> no poker face at all. Says what he thinks. Um, and it did, you know, it wasn't what West Indies cricket needed. And from that perspective, forget what how good he was on the field. Um, but yeah, I didn't put him on the list just because I thought his knees um, were not quite at the level that he thought he could continue to play. And the fact that he didn't even make it to the next IPL, um, mm. I do think gives you an idea that maybe, I'm not saying he enjoyed the cuss out and wasn't going to leave anyway, but I do wonder if he just thought to himself, I just don't know if I can do this at this level anymore. Having said that, Michelle. He is actually still playing in the UAE, in that other league. Um, so I don't know, but that's why I didn't put it down. Um, all right, what have you got at number, what was that? That was number two. So you got Puran at number two. Uh, what have you got at number three? So this was a late entry. And by late, I mean, I literally changed my list one second before you press record. So <laughs> no, number three is John Campbell's drug ban. Um, that wasn't originally in my top five. I where to put this. Yes, yeah, so it wasn't in mine. It wasn't in mine. And I've suddenly now decided it's got to come number three. Now, <laughs> the, the reason I put it number three is... Again, it's, what, cricket has seen drug bans before. So this isn't anything new. Like It's, it's not like, oh my gosh, a player suddenly suddenly had a drug ban what's going on in cricket but a four-year drug ban <laughs> now, now, that's now. that's something else I, oh, also i don't know how many people know about drug the history of drugs in cricket but before 2017 players weren't their blood wasn't tested hmm. so the only thing that was tested was their urine and i think their hair or whatever that other one is right so we we went out of our way in cricket not to test players. Um, it happened to be the, the, the era where a lot of players got really big and strong. I don't know. Maybe that's a coincidence. Uh, but, yeah, the four-year, um, that's, um, that's not I accidentally took the wrong uh, cold and flu medicine, is it? No, it's not. And even now as, we, as we're recording, there's still a lot of grey area about what exactly has gone on here. Many people in Jamaica believe that John Campbell is being made a – um a kind of scapegoat um and that there's wider politics going on and it's all about jadco having to prove that they're a stringent drugs testing organization but it's weird because some would rightly say mash how can you have how can you have john campbell in your top five he's not that important of a player so but it's not about i'm not really looking at the player here i'm more just looking at the scandal and again, it's wider optics on what it says about West Indies cricket. Because again, it's another situation that is nothing to do with the administration. They didn't tell John Campbell to have a whereabouts or... Sorry, it was not even whereabouts. They were there. They came to his house. They didn't tell John Campbell not to provide a sample. But from an optics point of view to the wider cricketing world, you would look at West Indies cricket and say, that organisation is an absolute mess. So it's about 
how these different factors combine together to just make an administration that's actually probably trying their best, really and truly, to improve the fortunes of West Indies cricket. But it's almost like West Indies, West Indies cricket, whether that means the players, whether that means other kinds of stakeholders, we can't help ourselves. We've got to have a scandal. We've got to have some kind of scandal which makes us look like an absolute mess on and off the pitch. So that's why I think I've thrown it in there because of how it's made the product look to the wider cricket fan base. So I didn't put it in there, but I did. The thing that bothers me about it is we've now had two Jamaican cricketers mm. uh, be suspended for drugs. If it was one from Trini and one from Guyana or one from Jamaica and one from Barbados, I'd be like, ah, you know, there's, there are drugs in cricket and people are taking them and it wouldn't surprise me if it's far more rife, far, far, far more rife than we, we actually know. Two Jamaican cricketers just feels a little bit on the nose, especially because of what we know about Jamaican sports in general. Um, it just it feels a bit icky. But I, the thing is, maybe because it is John Campbell, I couldn't, I just couldn't jam it in. I didn't know where to put that information. Um, all right, I'm going to go on. So we've done your first three. So you've got Hetmeyer, Pollard, and Campbell. Number two, I have, unsurprisingly, uh, West Indies T20 World Cup campaign. And I think it's unfair to call it that. Is it a campaign? It's a brochure, perhaps. Uh, it was a, a paid vacation. Uh, and, and, I said before the tournament, I think you and Santoki were pretty much, we were probably three of about 20 people in the world going, yeah, they're probably not going to qualify for the next round, or at the very least, it's not going to be easy. Um, most people are like, ah, oh, they'll be fine. I think it's fair to say that we knew that coming in, and they still, for me, went under the bar of how I thought they would play. They did not look like they had a batter who could score over 30 runs, realistically. I know um, there was a couple of runs scored in one of the games. Shamar Brooks being back in that side is just, it feels like a crime against early West Indies T20 culture. Um, and uh, they, they on the field, there was no, there was no energy from their team, but also strategically, they looked like they were playing T20 cricket from years ago. Nicholas Perrin didn't seem to understand how to captain a side. And I think he's a very smart young man. He might end up being a very good captain one day, but this wasn't it. Phil Simmons' tactics, I mean, they seem to work in 2016, but T20 cricket has probably changed more than any two, uh, any formats moved in in six years in that period. Um, and it's hard, and and I'm more than willing to say that if you look at it on a talent basis, that West Indies team is probably still maybe the eighth best team in that tournament. But that makes it worse that they actually performed in that way. Yeah, and I I, I like what you said that they still performed under the low bar. That, um, that that you had set. <laughs> and I actually have to agree with that because as much as I spent time telling everyone, but I thought this was going to happen, I still didn't think it was going to be as dreadful as it actually ended up being. I thought we still wouldn't qualify or that we'd struggle really badly to try and get through to the next stage, but it was even worse than, <laughs> than I imagined it than I imagined it would be. Um, so I I just tried to console myself in saying, "Well, I told you so." But yes, I will now admit that was even worse than I expected. <laughs> so um, so yeah, you're right to put it number two. I do have something related to white ball, but that's my number four. All right, we'll get there in a moment. I'm going to throw something else at you for my number three, which I don't think you will have on your list. Um, and it's the fact that Trent Bolt and Martin Guptill have retired from their national contracts uh, to play essentially for franchises and everything else. And the reason it's there is that it's been thrown around. In fact, Raul Drava did it the other day, which didn't really make any sense what he said, but he said, we can't let Indian players play in other leagues uh, because I'll end up being like the West Indies cricketers. And it's like, well, the West Indies cricketers do it because they don't get paid by their, <laughs> their board very well, whereas Indian cricket could quadruple any payment that any other board would ever give their players if they wanted to, and they could solve that problem in a click of a fingers. But the issue that I had is that now what we had before was a system where Carlos Brathwaite and Chris Gale and Kyron Pollard were freelance cricketers with one really good contract and then a bunch of smaller contracts that even if they're form dip, they'd be able to keep cashing in on, right? Mm. Now, 
the, the new model going forward is that Obed McCoy could easily just sign up with the Royals for three or four different leagues and never have to play for the West Indies again and also get a long-term contract perhaps into the future in some of these leagues so that he doesn't have to worry about being, you know, the best player he can year on year on year. He can actually just focus on all that sort of stuff. And I'm just picking him because he's with the Royals and the Royals have a bunch of t players. It could be Puran. It could be you know, whoever else, although there's not many uh, West Indians left in the IPL, which might be on your list. So I'm going to leave that for a minute. But I think the fact that we've now seen it with New Zealand means that it's obviously not a West Indies problem, but it is probably going to affect West Indies even more so because in, in uh, New Zealand, I don't know what Bolt was on, about three hundred dollars to $350,000 a year probably on his contract. I think uh, Kane Williamson's on about 400000 so beyond less than that. Uh, no West Indian cricket is on three or 400,000 US dollars a year to play for the West Indies cricket team, right? And so it just means that now there are opportunities for players to not just go freelance, but to actually be long-term contracted to multiple franchises in the world, which makes the West Indies cricket board even less important than it has been before. That's a really good answer. And it's something that I didn't, it's something that I didn't consider, but then... As you started explaining it, I've got a perfect example to use to echo the point you've made. So we've in the just completed CPL, we had Ramon Simmons, who had a really good domestic season with Barbados um, uh, Pride, uh, the four-day team. He then went to play for the Barbados Royals in CPL. And then after CPL, the... Are they called Paul Royals, the South African one? Um, they've picked him up now for that South African uh, competition. Now, Ramon, Ramon Simmons is 21 years old, is yet to play for the West Indies, but already is going... <laughs> it's already probably made just as much as any West Indian player <laughs> has made by going from CPL straight across now to the South African competition next year all this without playing a significant amount of cricket. Now, I hope at some point down the in the future, Ramon Simmons may well get called up to a West Indies A-side and then a future West Indies team. But it's also plausible that if he then went and had a good tournament in South Africa, why would the next Royals franchise not then just take him to the next competition and so on and so forth? So I guess I'm saying this more for the people listening. This is a seriously pl this is plausible argument that we could see the next stage of asset stripping, but this time before players even play for the West Indies. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I don't and, know why I think I'm the other thing is <laughs> because it's gallows humour. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think one of the reasons we haven't seen as many freelance cricketers. Um, is Chris Gale was actually a story that scared a lot of players off doing it. Chris Gale had a form dump. Right where mm -hmm. he just basically he he wasn't taking his cricket as seriously as he should have been in his late thirties, and Jamaica got rid of him as you will remember. Uh, yeah, he lost his gig in the IPL, and a lot of players around the world saw that and they went, well, "I'm not Chris Gale, so I can't do that." The other reason is for insurance purposes. If you get injured, if you don't have a contract with anyone, your rehab has to be paid for you, and you know if you're not in it, well. If you're anywhere in the world and you're playing for private health insurance, it costs a lot of money. And you can imagine with a professional athlete how much they need to spend on all that sort of stuff. If you're in a situation where you're contracted to the Royals for three different teams, say, right? Uh, and you, if that's the case and you have contracts with all of them coming up, you probably would also be able to negotiate some sort of health benefits where they, mm. they would be helping you out with local physios and doctors and whatever else you would need, scans and all those other sorts of things. And if you're on a long-term contract, you then, of course, could pay for it yourself, right? Because you don't have to worry about getting a bunch of money and then missing out. So it's just, it's a changing of the structure of it. And I think we know every time in professional cricket, when something has changed the structure of it, the West Indies are like, the, the West Indies are basically like the porn industry. When it comes mm. to... Any major changes in technology, porn is always there first. Any changes in professionalism in cricket, the West Indies are there first. Because their players don't get paid at home, they're so susceptible to everything else that happens. And I just feel that we've seen it with Bolt, but the only reason we're seeing it with Bolt ahead of seeing it with some of the West Indian players is just because a few of those West Indian players aren't actually on that level or are already freelance. 
Like Sunil Narayan's mm. freelance, right? Andre Russell's freelance. And and they're on a level where you can be freelance. The problem is if it keeps going down those lower levels to so that everyone becomes freelance, that's when the West Indies will be, abs- as you, what did you say, asset stripped. Right? That's yeah. what I see as well. All right, let's get to your number four, sir. Number four. <clears throat> so you had the T20 team at number two. I put number four yes. as I just called it West Indies white ball woes in general. Um, and I'm intrigued to see how you respond to this. So I didn't split it between T20 and ODIs. I just put it all together because truth be told, Jared, we're useless in both white ball formats. Um, so we, 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 we've, we've just seen the T20 World Cup. So I don't feel like I need to talk about how useless we are in that format. But in ODI cricket this year, we played over 20 games and we won five three of which with respect were against the netherlands and that netherlands side was missing half the players who play in english county cricket and i I was there to watch that and i remember being there watching it thinking yep this seems about our level right about now (laughs) so 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 also when i if i remember you didn't you didn't dominate that series either if i no, no, not at all not not at all every every single game was close (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't as if you went to the Netherlands and played their B team and like and they had like teenagers who we just saw be not be rubbish in the World Cup, that'd be unfair, but certainly not major international level plays at their age. You know, Vikram Jeet Singh and these sorts of players. And, and who's that old middle aged player that was batting it, 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 it T Hass or whatever his name is in the middle order? Like just, with all respect to him, and I hope he becomes a great cricketer, but could not look any more like a bloke who played club cricket. And, you know, has just ended up in the Netherlands middle order because, as you said, everyone else is in county cricket. And you hope that he develops because they need someone like him. But, yeah. So, at number five on my list, I have West Indies probably not qualifying for the... No, no, no. Oh, so I'm going to number five. So, my next one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I have have separated T20 World Cup and one day stuff. So, number five, I have West Indies probably not qualifying for the ODI World Cup. Um, Or at the least... On the way to not qualifying. The reason I split them up is because I still think, and I think when you go through that T20 side, especially if you look at what could be full strength, if Hetmeyer had gone on the plane, um, you know, Fabian Allen had been picked, Andre Russell, son on her own, all these sorts of people, right? If they'd all been available and they'd played, I still think there is something of that T20 side. You could jazz it up, get a new coach, maybe, you know, do something with it. The one day team... Might as well fold <laughs> because yes, I have yes. no idea how in the next three years they're going to get any better at one day cricket unless Nicholas Puran averages 80. I just can't see how they will consistently make scores of over 240 in one day cricket. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say this because whilst I didn't write down the ODI team should fold, I wrote down there is little <laughs> to no chance that we... I. Uh, put it this way jared i will be shocked if we make it to the odi world cup i will be, that's how that's how little i rate our odi cricket we've just had we've just had a super 50 tournament uh which is our flag bearing 50 over tournament in the caribbean where seeing a score over 250 was like oh that's good so 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 when when do you Did when Pur- you extrapolate was Puran, that? it was Puran the leading scorer in that one in the tournament. He was the lead. Uh, no, Robin Powell actually. So Robin Powell and Nicholas Puran were the top two run scorers, but they were also the only two players with a strike rate above a hundred, or like within the kind of territory strike rate that you would associate with modern OGI cricket. And we've seen their struggles at the top level of OGI cricket. So in essence, I guess what I'm trying to say is, we already know that our quote unquote best players struggle in the format. And we haven't, and we've got little to nothing underneath it to replace them. So if everybody then accepts that what we're currently doing in OJ cricket is so backwards or so far behind what everyone else is doing, how do we get to a World Cup then? And and uh, mm. to put in perspective, Jared, I don't think rain and a dodgy umpire decision is going to help us this time. <laughs> Scotland is sitting there going, this must be our time. Um, <laughs> what, one thing I would say that's really interesting is that because it's because of playing Netherlands when they're half 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 a team, like they've actually got points that they shouldn't have got. 
right? Like, yeah, they're they're probably higher than what you and I actually think of them. I mean, for for those who don't remember, they lost to Ireland at home when Ireland yep. had to use their batting coach because Ireland had no fit players to be able to actually put on the field because of COVID. Like, that's how bad things have got for for the West Indies one day team. And there's just the only way I could see them getting good is if they just went all in with all their best seamers and like started bowling teams out for 180 occasionally. Like I just, I can't see any other way they're going to be able to do anything good uh, with, with what they currently have. So yeah, no, I'm, I just, I mean, I, don't, I haven't looked in the one day. The, the one, the one thing I would say is I did the world test championship, uh, predictions of who would make the final i think i had india pakistan in the final and there's still a chance mm -hmm. of that but australia's outperformed what i thought they would do and um so i think australia will probably make it now and pakistan's got a chance of joining them but i don't know if you've seen but sri lanka actually have a chance of making that final as well and um it, it's an outside chance and sri lanka had such a good draw um available to them and i was thinking afterwards what kind of a draw would the West Indies ODI team had needed to actually even qualify for the World Cup, let alone like make it into the top two best teams? And it's just, it's impossible. They would have to, yeah. th there is no ODI team that the West Indies could play over and over again that would make them uh, end up in the top two teams. Yeah, that, that, that's facts. That's just facts. <laughs> that, that, the, I'm, I'm just glad that someone else outside of like, West Indies cricket or outside the Caribbean is saying it so that so that when Santoki and I say it, people don't think it's just doom and gloom like it. We're rubbish. We're actually rubbish. That's bad. <laughs> I remember talking to Andy Andy Balburnie about it and when they beat when Ireland beat them. And he was saying, Yeah, no, we we think we're a better team than the West Indies in one day cricket. And he wasn't gloating, right? It wasn't like he was like he wasn't cussing them. But he was saying it so matter of factly that it was just like it was, he was just agreeing with my premise. Do you know what I mean? Of yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, we're we're a better one day team than them. Didn't even have he didn't have to think he didn't you know that's the thing that associate well not they're a test nation now but you know smaller nations do sometimes where they couch it so they don't get attacked mm -hmm. like the next time the west there was no couching it. He was like yeah no I think that's true. Um, okay, number five on your list. I I think I should change my number five, but I am gonna just go with what I wrote down. Um, so it's, I should change five because of what we just said about white ball cricket, but I've got Phil Simmons going as number five, which is a weird one. It's a controversial one because to all intents and purposes, most people would say, good, that's the, <laughs> that's a good thing, but mm. I guess I'm trying. I'm trying to separate things here in the same way how you just said you separated T20 and OGI. I'm separating Tests and white ball cricket, and our white ball woes, which are all valid, and someone's got to be held accountable, and Phil's being held accountable, and Puran's fallen on his sword, Pollard fell on his sword, this, that, and the other. But actually, when you look at West Indies Test record under Phil Simmons, we. <sighs> I don't know how to really, I don't really know what criteria to use. But at the end of the day, Jared, we 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 beat England in the Caribbean. And yes, everyone's going to try and say, yeah, but that was England before Baz Ball and this, that and the other. We still beat England in the Caribbean. England mm. are still fundamentally a better test cricket nation than we are. And we beat them in the Caribbean. We drew with Pakistan in the Caribbean. We drew with Sri Lanka in the Caribbean. We beat Bangladesh in the Caribbean. Now, of course, some people are going to say, yeah, but you lost to Sri Lanka away. Well, the best West Indies sides lost to Sri Lanka away. So that's, that, 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 that's nothing new. So I guess the reason I've put Simmons going is because such is our desire in the Caribbean to put the blame of everything at one person's door that we can sometimes make kind of scorched earth decisions or bat and, and of some, sorry, people say, yeah, but Phil Simmons resigned. Of course he did because he, he would have realized I've got a goal, but I Resigned. guess what I'm getting at, <laughs> what, what I'm getting at is it would have been good to find a way to keep him on as the Red Bull coach because there are some shoots of promise in, in Red Bull cricket in the last, 
uh, two years, we've seen Carl Mayers come on the scene, Josh De Silva, and Krumah Bonnet. The test team looks like a team that at least knows how to be better than the sum of their parts. And yeah. I just wonder if that's an own goal that we've we've kind of engineered there um, in in Red Bull cricket. Yeah, I mean, that's the best team, and you've lost the guy who built that structure, right? Yeah. So. From that perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I didn't have Simmons on the list just because I just felt like he was finished. Uh, mm. That I, I, I don't know how long you can be a West Indian and do that job. Yeah. <laughs> because I just think after a certain – every island you go to, you know, there's – even your home island, you're probably going to be under pressure. And I just – and there's no way – you and I know there's no – there's no magical – Brendan McCullum coach out there, right? Mm. That's going to fix what is happening with West Indies cricket altogether. You may get a little baseball bump somehow if a new coach comes in and shakes things up a little bit. But overall, <laughs> there ain't no coach that's going to fix that situation. And Simmons would have been looking at this going, I'm not sure what I've got left to work with here. And mm. I, I think you're right. I think the best case scenario would have been if he stayed on for the Red Bull. But I just think that was untenable because of... West Indian fans and media, I just don't, you know, every press conference would have been about when he was going from here on in. And there was a certain point where you can't beat that. I remember yeah, when Andrew Strauss point, was struggling. Yeah. I mean, the first question was Chris Stocks, who was with the Metro back in those days, asked that first question where he said, Andrew, you know, we all love you, but when are you leaving? From the moment that first question gets asked, it just doesn't stop. Right. And the press is one thing, but if he's walking through an airport, if he's going to get some, you know, a meal with his family, whatever it is, it's just going to be under that kind of pressure. And I think that's where Phil Simmons was. I, I think it's, I didn't have it on my list because I was thinking about it more from the point of view that it was, it was inevitable that he left. But mm. I think hearing you say that, I, I still don't think it should be on my list, but I now, I could see why it would have been, it would have been number six with a bullet just because if they have one team that is functioning close to what a professional top level international cricket team should be, that team just lost its coach. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we can sit here and go, oh, his tactics in, in T20 cricket have been terrible and no one can bat under him and all this sort of stuff. But we can also sit there and go, actually, we are okay as a, one, as a test team and have been pretty much since he got back involved. It's been up and down at times, but yeah. yeah. Okay, that's the number five. So the one I haven't mentioned yet is number four. And it's interesting it's not on your list. It's a little bit further back, so I'm not sure if, if you did it from that pers perspective. But Stefani Taylor is my number four because she's the first woman to choose, to do a similar thing to the men. And Oh, DeAndre, DeAndre Dottin, you mean? Oh, it is DeAndre Dottin. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. God. Wrong, 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 uh, wrong. Well, I was going to say wrong captain, but that might have been the problem there. DeAndre Dotton, sorry. Um, uh, Lee, I, was, I had Stefani Taylor on my mind because she plays for the Strikers. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, DeAndre Dotton um, stepping back because she's the first player to follow that West Indies men's template, right? And for those who don't know, up until recently, if you were playing women's cricket, it's because you absolutely love the sport, right? And I think almost every woman who's over the age of 22 is literally, if even if they're an international player, they're there because they love the sport first, which isn't always the case with men. Some men are just good at it, and so they play it because it pays them good money. We're now getting to the point where this is all changing, of course, and women are starting to play for money, and it makes sense. You know, they put their bodies through it the same that the men have, you know, um, and, and so now they're starting to look at it more. But the fact that you have a player who is, how old is she? 31? 30, 31, 31. Yeah. She's 31. Okay. Women don't tend to play on quite as late as men because they, you know, they develop a little bit quicker and they play senior cricket at a younger age. You still would have thought that she had three good years to give West Indies cricket. West Indies are just on the back of making the semifinals of the World Cup in Australia. Was that this year? What year are we in? Was it last year? Uh, it was start of this year, yeah. Semi-finals. Yeah, start of this year. She made the semi-finals of that tournament, and now you've got a player leaving. Now, it's not just 
uh, it's not just West Indies cricket, of course. Lazelle Lee also did a similar thing. And I think you'll probably see a few more top of the top 10, top 15 players outside of the major nations. I think you'll see a, a couple of them just go, why would we deal with getting paid no money to play for our boards when we can actually get paid professionally and, and do these things in other ways? However, I think with the West Indies, there's a particular, oh shit. Now it's happening yes. with the women side of things that, and I know that you, you did that great episode about, I might've even made a video about your episode where you, you guys were talking about the fact that it feels like she didn't get the captaincy and that's why she left. Players do that, right? That's, that happens in professional cricket. I think the difference is that she can do that. Yeah. And once you find an excuse, then the next player will find an excuse. Then the next player will find an excuse. And honestly, I can't imagine that in West Indies uh, women's cricket, there is going to be anywhere near enough money ever to be able to keep uh, every time they find a talented player. Now I would assume there is a very big chance that they will leave to become um, uh, professionals uh, elsewhere. Do you know what? That's brilliant that you've raised that. And I'm admonishing myself for not having that in my list. I I reckon. Well, if it makes you I feel better, I, I got the wrong woman to start with. So <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're I, all okay here. We weren't perfect on this one. <laughs> I I think I've missed that one out because so much has happened in the last six months. I I think I just forgot that that had even happened. So that's another thing to add to the to the list. But um, what I would just say off the back of what you said about Deandra, and it's it. it it's the same, as you say, it's the same thing repeating itself now with the women's game for the West Indies as with the men's. But the story's also the same in so much as we have overachieved. We, oh, sorry, we massively overachieved to get to the semifinals uh, mm. this year, right? But much like with the men when this started happening, we actually don't have a deep enough talent pool to allow for this. So I'm, I'm not saying that, England and Australia and India, let's just pick those three, maybe in South Africa as well, could lose one of their top players and it wouldn't make a significant difference, but they could get by. We lose one of our top players and we have no one who even comes like a tenth close to what that top player. So God forbid Stefani Taylor is the next player to do it because yeah. then that literally just leaves Hayley Matthews as the one sole West Indian women's player who another team would wish was in their side. If 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 you see what I mean, and um, yeah. the, the, the 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 I guess the reason why I make it make this point is because surely now the next generation of West Indian women's players they would have seen that Deandra Dottin she just won WBL um, uh, in Australia was I think she got the she was the was player of the match in that in 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 that particular final was she not? Um, is the precedent now set? for the next set of players to look at and go, well, Deandra was able to make more money leaving West Indies. So I, I, I just worry for the kind of, that's not Deandra's fault, by the way. So I don't want anyone coming away from this going, oh, you're trying to say that she's a mercenary. No, not at all. She's just doing what she can do. But she's I just wonder, yeah, you've got to do what you can do. You've got, you've got to earn your money. I just wonder though, if that now sets the precedent. Uh, you, you were, both watch the women's CPL and I'm assuming like me, you've seen other women's competitions at time. When you were talking about the drop off, it's a big drop off. Yeah. yeah. There's some, um, there's some um, cricketers in that women's CPL and it was what three teams. Yeah. Yeah. And there were some women where you're just like, you know, these women aren't in a squad in the WBBL, let alone, yeah. you know, it, and I'm not talking about overseas players. I'm saying if they were Australian, like it was a big drop off. And that's my worry is that there's been a bit of a golden generation, as you said, that the three, you know, the sort of three main players who, and and to be fair, Hayley Matthews probably hasn't lived up to the original promise yeah. that we thought. She's probably a bowler who bats a little bit. And because she played that, you know, like Carlos Brathwaite, plus innings against Australia. We've almost seen her as a batter and she can't bat at that level. Or that she's still handy with the bat. Um, but yeah, those are the three players. And then after that, and, and then that's, that's why I had it on my list. I just, they can't afford to lose them. I mean, if you go back to the South African one, I think South Africa, are obviously a better team with Lizelle Lee in it. But at the same time, 
I think they can cover Lazelle Lee. They may not be able yeah. to do it if Marazan Cap retire, uh, retires and, and if Wolfart goes, then they're in the shit as well. But they can cover one or two players, whereas you look mm. at the West Indies and you just like, they just had probably the best run in a tournament since they made that final against Australia yeah. in whenever that was, uh, 2014 or whenever it was. Was it 2016? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. When Elise Perry beat them with a broken leg. Um, uh, so... It's yeah, it's bad. So that's why it was on my list. Um, have we got what was your number five again? Oh, your number five was Phil Simmons. Simmons, yeah. yeah. All right. So let's wrap up here. Just point out that the chairman of selectors was fired. Fired or quit? Roger Harper. Uh, Do we know? Uh, same. They're both the same thing. It was in his. <laughs> Step down. Um, <laughs> Nicholas Puran, how long was he captured for? Six months, if that. And that hasn't made our list. And we don't have that much crossover in our list. So you've got, I've got Hetmeyer, West Indies T20 World Cup, the Trent Bolt thing, DeAndre Dalton, West Indies at the, uh, maybe not qualifying for the next World Cup. You've got Hetmeyer, Pollard, John Campbell, uh, West Indies White Ball Woes, which I suppose is covered by me and Phil Simmons. And we couldn't fit in the fact that Nicholas Puran didn't last a year as captain. And not only that, here's the thing I would have said. If I would have slipped it in, and I don't, I couldn't. I couldn't even get it above seven. I reckon I had John Campbell ahead of it as well, right? Couldn't even get it that high. But if I'd have slipped it in, I would have had to have been really honest and be like, the over or under on him making it to a year of captain of, the, of that team. <laughs> it was like, it's, nine months was about, the, nine months, if I was laying odds, would have been about the moment I would have thought, would have been the most likely length of that. I would have thought maybe they fuck up in the T20 World Cup. He goes out, they lose a couple of games, and he's just like, anyway, thanks for the opportunity. It's been fun. I'll see you guys around. If you're ever in India, call me. Um, and uh, <laughs> instead, it went even worse than we thought, and because of that, he's walked out. But there were, what would have had to have happened for Nicholas Piran to make it a year in that job? They would have had to make the next round of that T20 uh, World Cup, and then they would have had to have won two games. Almost physically impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which it would, and so now that's why, now I feel more vindicated in having Pollard quitting as my number two because of the, mm. the, it's not Pollard's fault. I'm not saying that, but if you're, what you're saying, I thought as well, I didn't think Puran would last that long in the job. So, Puran should never have been given the job then. Like he should never have, he should never have had the chance to take the role so soon. And that for me goes back to Pollard quitting. But the thing is, and I listened to you, you and Santoki talking about this the other day. Uh, you've got Robin Powell's probably going to get the job, right? Yeah. Over and under 10 months. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, if he lasts yeah. a year, yeah. if he lasts a year, something remarkable has happened. Because I think he wants to be West Indies captain. I think that more so than Puran, he sees himself as a leader. I think he's got more yeah. of that personality. But I also think that they're going to get smacked in the face in a lot of cricket. And if he ends up being captain of the one-day team uh, and they don't qualify for the World Cup, are you like... <laughs> just... Listen, he could, he, could be, he could get the job next month and be gone by March when we... <laughs> gone, gone by June when we don't get to the yeah. World Cup. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not putting it out of the realms of possibility that he's the last West Indian ODI captain based on, <laughs> on our conversation today. We're just like, we're not going to split up as a team. We're not going to go back and be individual teams. We're just going to keep T20 and hope that works again. And test cricket, is Phil available? Can Phil come back? <laughs> Listen, we we laugh, but these these are some these these are some of the serious issues. <laughs> so we shall see, though. All right. I've got one last question for you. So you did that great mm. series on on the podcast uh, about the um, the three. Um, uh, sorry, if if West Indies cricket was split up, which I think we both agree won't happen because yeah. it kind of can't. Even if even if you pro it, which I'm not, I'm just not sure not sure how it could happen. Where where did, which format of cricket is a West Indian island or Guyana going to be the highest ranked? Right. So, so let's say Barbados is the best test team, right? Yeah. And they're not going to have test status, of course, <laughs> but let's say they are the best test team. 
where would you rank them? Are they, they're probably below Ireland and Afghanistan. So they're just outside of the test playing nations. Are they better than the Netherlands and Scotland? The, and, and I'm assuming we're saying Barbados. Yeah. Uh, I would say so in test cricket. Yeah. Barbados would be. I think we would give Ireland a good game. Oh, so we Barbados would give Ireland a good game in test cricket. So, so, so then you're saying they're about the alert at best. They could be at the 11th or 12th best team. Yeah. I think they'd beat Bangladesh actually in the Caribbean. But yeah, I don't know if it's seeing, but, I don't think seeing much. I think they'd beat Bangladesh. But but I think but to be higher ranked, you'd have to win consistently against you know a few teams because Bangladesh are going to win a lot more at home than Barbados are. Yeah, good I point. Okay, thought. yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, valid, valid. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's let's say let's give them a friendly twelfth, equal twelfth with Ireland there. Yeah. One day cricket. Who's the? I don't even know who the best is. It Trinidad, the best one day team. Okay. Let's argument say let's say it's Trinidad, right? Let's just say, yeah, let's just use them as arguments. Like, I think they would. Hmm. I, I don't I think, think they're better put... than Scotland, N Netherlands, or Namibia in one day cricket. Yeah, I think that's about and right. I think they'd I... Yeah, I... I think they'd trade. I think they'd trade I, I think wins they'd and losses against with the Scotland. USA. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. that. I was just yeah. trying to work I... out if I'd put them in the bracket with USA or not. Because USA are probably around that Scot they Scotland's a lot better, I think, at T20 cricket. But at the moment, as they currently stand, I think USA, I think they might have even beat um, Scotland in a couple of one days. So, uh, okay. So at that stage, we're saying they're the 14th or 15th best side. All right? Yeah. Who's the best T20 side? Is it Guyana? I, okay. I mean, ugh, because of CPL's structure alone overseas players it's hard to tell but uh, it, uh let's just say any one side right again it probably would be a guyana or a trinidad um yeah and again in terms of t20 cricket i do think they'd be better than the united states so let's put them above that level um would they so west indies just got knocked out by zimbabwe island and scotland right so by default yeah you'd have to say they're just under that level, just by default. Whatever that so that's is, the, whether I that's Nepal that's, or something. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's Oman, UAE level. Yeah, that's that's where the best T20 side. Uh, like, I hope nobody in the Caribbean listens to this because they will consider what I just said sacrilege. But I think that's where they, I think the best T20 side would be just underneath the 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 the, the, the eight that got to the first round of the World Cup. Yeah, it would be it would be hard to see them at the the at a level where they're better than Scotland or that they're better than you know Zimbabwe or or or, um, or Namibia at this stage, based on the fact that the West Indies don't look particularly that much better than that, and they're pulling from a lot more you know talent. But I think that just shows, like you know, for the people who want them to split up or you know the people who think they might as well split up, it's kind of. West Indies cricket would be almost irrelevant at that point, right? It's not to yeah. say that would, stars wouldn't come through because stars would definitely come through. And, you know, I mean, West Indies still produced NBA stars occasionally as we, you know, we did that podcast on that. It's, we're not saying that they wouldn't have good players, but it would be irrelevant in the wider discussion of cricket from that point forward, just because you would need an absolute 1950s Barbados level golden generation to ever be back in a situation where they were a legitimate top eight team uh, from the Caribbean. And even then, I think you'd be pushing it. Yeah, it's also worth pointing out as well that everyone has to remember that once and if the West Indies did split up, that the funding streams then uh, yeah. disappear as well. So then you have to ask yourself, can any of those individual islands fund an a uh, a cohesive, effective, professional cricket side? And actually the answer is probably no. <laughs> so, so that yeah, and, and I think the only thing I would say is that I think the governments would fund their own players' development a little bit more if it was if you're playing yeah, for Jamaica okay, yeah. or Trinidad yeah. or Guyana. But I still don't think that's enough to overcome uh, the benefits that you have. So one of the benefits I think West Indies cricket has always had is that 
pitches are so different from island to island and, and from location to location. You actually take a bit of that away if it's just Trinidad playing against Trinidad, right? Um, mm. uh, you know, it, so it's interesting. I just wanted to throw that out there because I heard you guys, I, I really like that three-part series that you guys did, but I've been thinking about it a lot. I just don't, and I think when we're talking about those things, some of that is best case scenario, right? Yeah. Worst case scenario is there's some, you know, I didn't watch much of the Super 50 this year, but over the last couple of years, I've, you know, I've, I've watched a fair bit of it. So you look at some of the guys about five and six domestically in West Indies cricket, you know, it's, it's a big, big drop off compared to, you know, other, other nations and, and people who are batting number five and six. And, uh, it's a, I think people need to understand that if those sorts of things happened, you, you talk about the difference between having West Indies as a major part of cricket and literally just not having them as major part of cricket. Pretty much. I can't, dis I, I can't disagree. So I, I guess as Santoki and I said, we just have to limp on. That's, how, that's all we can do. <laughs> limp on. Well, that's a beautiful way to finish this podcast. Thanks for coming on again, man. And I will no chat worries. to you again very soon. Awesome. See you soon.